hear the church say amen. amen. You got you to gotta do better than that. Amen. 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 We just heard the young people declaring that their allegiance is with Jesus. not for his mercy. Where would we be? It was not for his grace. I know I may speak for myself, I wouldn't be here. Because of his grace. His grace that has brought me through many a hard trials. It is his mercy that has kept me from the day I was conceived unto this moment, it is because of the goodness of our Lord. Happy Sabbath Church. We have been having a wonderful time from morning until now. To God be the glory. And happy Father's Day to all our wonderful men. When we, when we stood up earlier this morning, it was a beautiful sight. It was a beautiful sight. There's something I have to adjust in my sermon because in my, in my thought, I was thinking that we had more women today than men, but the men are looking good <laughs> and well represented. Praise God. Praise God. That's a beautiful sight. It's a beautiful sight. So happy Father's Day. To all the men and the beautiful women who are in your life. According to the dictionary, a father is a male parent. A male parent. Right? In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, the Bible declares that we should what? Honor our father and our mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. So it is a command with a promise that if we honor our parents, because I like the way the Bible always presents the topic of parenthood. It never presents one without the other. Because you won't have a father without a mother. I thought the woman would, 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 would say amen. amen. And you won't have the mother without the father. So I like the way the Bible always presents it. God is a God full of wisdom. Bow your heads with me at this moment as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, mighty God, for the work of salvation. We thank you for your mighty act, O oh God, through sending your son Jesus to rescue men from the pit of sin. Loving God and our Father, we pray even now that your spirit will come by here in full power so that Jesus Christ and him only will be lifted up. We ask that you will arrest every attention, almighty God, so that we will be drawn into a closer relationship with you. We pray, Lord, that you will bless every family represented here today. And may as we tabernacle, as we worship, as we praise, May you alone receive all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When I was growing up, I always thought that I was a father as well, even before I got married and had a child. And the reason for that was because I had a father, an early father, who had demonstrated to me what it means to be a good man. And it's because of his role model that I was convinced that I was a father, even from a very early age. So fatherhood does not mean that you have to be the biological parent of a child. It was mentioned earlier. And I just want to reinforce the fact that all men who are men of God, who are supporting of another life, you are a father. You're qualified to be a father. So God is calling us today as we look under the theme, the caption, being God's man in tough times. 
in tough times, beloved. We live in an age today where men are considered endangered species. Good men are hard to find. So as a church, I'm encouraging us to protect and take care of our men at all costs. And I just want to caution parents who may be going through difficulty, a woman who may be going through difficulty in their relationship with their child's father to not use that child as a weapon. But allow your heart to be poured out to God in prayer and allow this child to become a mediator, one that will bring bond and unity within the family. Because most of our men today, beloved, have lost their identity. And because of this, many are locked up behind bars. Many are jobless. Some are hopeless. Many are purposeless. There are even some who are confused about their masculinity. And unfortunately, there are some who are no longer with us. So we have a great call upon our lives to be God's men in these tough times. Many today have lost their masculine identity because of where they are looking for answers. Finding a clear and precise definition of a masculinity is especially difficult if we turn to the world rather than turning to the word of God. Just consider for a moment what we learn about masculinity from our society. For those of you from Jamaica, if you should ask being a man, he would tell you that man they have no gal and gal in abundance. If we watch Sports and world and music, play video games and gadgets, those will teach us to love money, to love power, to incite violence and other ungodly behavior. And that is what society will use to define masculinity. It generally doesn't take long for a little boy to encounter an erotic image, explicit story, or grossly inappropriate jokes. Even if his parents successfully shield him from inappropriate content on television or online, his friends might pass along what they have seen and heard. Hence a boy's understanding of sexuality is often distorted from an early age. And that distorted view of sex deeply impacts his view of manhood. Because some believe that you're a man because you have many female companions. And that is not true. Therefore, we need a better definition of masculinity. And who better to define what masculinity is than God himself who created man? When God created Adam, he reached down to touch and mold man from the earth. With care and intimacy, he created man in a distinct way. God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now man... Adam could stand bearing the image of his maker. In the surrounding verses of Genesis chapter 2, we watch as God defines the purpose of this man prior to the creation of a woman. Ladies, listen to this. A man must find his purpose in life before finding a woman. Please ensure
sure that your suitor is a real man, a godly man, before you even entertain him. A man without a God-given purpose is unstable and unpredictable. But Adam knew his purpose, the purpose of his work, the expanse of his authority, the parameters of his obedience, and even the swelling of his desire for a wife. God gave him dominion over all the other creatures, but not over other human beings. So a man who wants to say he's the head and abuse his wife, he's not the head. Therefore, beloved, masculinity finds its definition not in the world, not in culture, not in the workplace, but in God alone who made him. Prior to the fall, beloved, Adam had face-to-face -face communion with God. There was no sign of blight or death in the atmosphere. He was holy and happy living in paradise, walking daily up and down on easy street. He had no hardship, no difficulty, no problem. He was indeed God's man in easy times, as it were. But all that soon to be disrupted by the introduction of sin. So beloved, after the fall, man now tries to find his own identity and his own purpose. Upon the discovery of their nakedness, they sewed fig leaves together and wore that as their covering. Now God's man has become the devil's man, living in tough times. The Bible declares that now Adam had to till the soil. And the word says, by the sweat of his brow, he shall eat bread. But God had no intention to leave his creation like that. So God had a plan. God had a plan to redeem man, to bring him back into his image and into his likeness. His plan was once to be established before the foundation of the world. God's plan was to send his own son to endure tough times, some hardship, some temptation, yet without sin. In book of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 3 says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adaptation of of sons. Beloved, Jesus endured tough times, not for himself, but for all of us. From the manger to the cross, he suffered hardship. In Isaiah 53, verse 2, he says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The Bible continues to say, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our sorrows and carried our griefs. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. God allowed hardship, beloved, to fall upon his dear son 
so that we might receive the benefit that God has for us. So while God has allowed hardship to befall us, to face, he says it is for character building. Hardship, beloved, is for our benefit, for character building to reform and reshape us back into right relationship with him. Tough times helps us to learn some very important lessons in life. Number one, tough time helps us to identify who our real friends are. Number two, the depth of your own strength is only realized when you are put to the test. Number three, tough time teaches us what really matters in life. And fourth, it teaches us how to be grateful. Adversity and hardship, beloved, contribute to character development when they cause personal reflection and introspection about a man's behavior and his influence. Hardship can cause men to look inside themselves, asking questions to which can result in huge learning and behavioral adjustments. Hardship can reveal a man's behave, behavioral blind spots, inconsistencies, weaknesses, personal limitations, and ineffective and bad behaviors. Hardship and adversity can also be a cleansing agent. They can have a refining effect upon our lives. Through suffering, the dross of one's personality can be removed. It can cause a man to look at personal behavior challenges related to anger, impatience, fear, selfishness, and so on. Adversity can also produce a clearer focus and concentration on what is important in life and what is not. There is also a maturing element to hardship and tough times. Mature means being seasoned, tested, hardened, weathered, ready, and fully developed. So my brothers and my sisters, my mothers and my fathers, I've heard it so often when we would say, I don't want my child to go through the difficulty that I went through. And yes, that is good and beneficial. But when you have robbed them of those valuable experiences in life, then you become an enabler and allow them to go through life with no appreciation for all the things that you have done. So tough times, beloved, doesn't mean your car broke down and you have to take the bus or the train. Tough time doesn't mean you come home, gentlemen, from work and your wife is still working on dinner. Tough time is not when you miss one paycheck and you believe the world is over. Tough times, bad times, beloved, are seasons of opportunity that God has given us to become the best person that we can become. The Bible tells us that those who live godly must suffer persecution. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. So we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Because we have been transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are not men of the world, but we are men of God, living in tough times. James encourages in James chapter 1 verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. 
Knowing this, that a trial of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that he may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Then verse 12 says, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. Sometimes tough times are a result of our own actions, our own doings, and our own choices. Have you ever wished you knew then what you know now? Have you ever wanted to rewind your life and start over? If only we could rewind and come again. If only it was that simple to deal with life problems. If only you could go back in time, you would not have taken your dad's car out of the garage which ended in an accident. If only you could go back in time, you would have listened to your mother's voice and leave that boy alone. If only you could go back, you would have supported your children like a good father should. If only you could go back in time, beloved. So many things you would have done differently. But we can't go back in time. We only have today. Let us not be fooled by the way we look and we come to church and we feel like everything is all right with everybody. Don't be fooled by the suits others are wearing and the cars they drive. Don't be fooled by the appropriate smiles and the happy Sabbath greetings. You don't know what the person sitting next to you had to go through to make it here today. You don't know what God had to save them from. You don't know how many times the devil tried to take them out, but God blocked it. You don't know. You don't know what someone else is going through. We all are facing tough times. So let us pray one for the other. Beloved, when you turn your Bibles with me in the book of Job, and while you're turning there, Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, it started, it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was what? Blameless, perfect, and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed or hated evil. This man, he had seven sons and three daughters. He had a lot of substance he loved his children and he prayed for them every day. But one day this man was tested and tried by the devil. But as the text outlines, the devil cannot touch you unless God allows it. So while we may encounter tough times, we need to remind ourselves that God is right beside us. Because he has promised us never to leave us, nor forsake us. He says when we go through the waters, he will be there. When we pass through the fires, he will be there. So Job was tested and tried. The Bible says in verse 9 of chapter 1, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear thee, thou for naught? Is this man your man just because of what you are doing for him? Has not thou made an edge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? 
Thou hast blessed the work of his hand and his substance, his priest in the land. Verse 11 says, But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will do what? Curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is here, is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. 14 says, And there came a messenger unto Job and said, What? The oxen were what? Plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And then what? The Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Tough times. While he was yet speaking, while Job was on that call, listening to that bad report, another call came in. He said, hold on, let me take this call. And the servant said, the fire of God is falling from heaven and had burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I only am escaped to tell thee. Tough times. 17 says, while he was yet speaking, another call came in. And they also said, the child is made of three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Tough times. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons have mercy. And thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell them. talk about tough times. When a father can lose his business, can lose his source of income, he knows in the back of his mind that he can rebuild and get back to where he was and even greater. But when a father would lose a child, No one, no parent wants to bury their child. And here Job had to deal with not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, not nine, but ten children all at the same time. Talk about tough times. But I'm happy to declare today, beloved, that Job was a man of God. He was God's man. And he prepared himself by the lifestyle of worship. He prepared himself by the lifestyle of prayer. So that when these tough times come, he still believed in God. Because the Bible says in verse 20, then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and wallowed and wailed. He fell down on the ground and called somebody and said, guess what happened to me? I lost all my earthly possession. And all my children just died. Why did God do this to me? Is that what the Bible says? The Bible.
Bible said he was on the ground worshiping God. Extreme of times, he was worshiping God. And he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return to the, the Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Bible says in all this, Job sinned not. Nor blame God. He was dealing with tough times. Amen. One secret in coping with tough times, beloved, is to realize that we can't control everything that happens to us. But we can control the way we respond. Situation and circumstances may change. But God never changes. The word of God tells us that he is the same yesterday. He is the same today. And he's the same forevermore. We know we can always rely on God at all times. But a question I want to ask you today. Can God rely on you? We all face tough times. Noah faced tough times when he had to build the ark before there was ever any sign of a rain. Abram had to deal with tough times when God asked him to sacrifice his own son. David had to deal with tough times when he had to face the giant Goliath. Moses had to face tough times when he had to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. We too, beloved, have to face our tough times. We have to be ready to know that God is going to be with us when the going gets tough. When the hills become hard to climb, we have to be assured that God is with us because we have a God in Jesus. Who will be our deliverer? Who will help us in our time of trouble? Jesus was a man who committed himself completely to his father. And we too need to commit ourselves completely to God. We all face tough times, beloved. But how are we going to respond to it. Job went as far as experiencing personal sickness. Sores, boils covered him from head to toe. After you have lost all your earthly possession, you have lost all your children, and now you have lost your very health. His wife told him, curse God and die. Now you have lost the one who should comfort you. But Job knew his Redeemer. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. And I will stand with him on that day when with my own eyes I will see him. Job know that though he slay me, yet he will trust him. Tough times, beloved, can we trust God when we cannot trace him? Can we trust God when the bills are piled high and no money is coming in? Can we trust God with our children? Can we trust God with our lives, beloved? There was a time when Job was getting weak in his faith, but God had to remind him that he was God. In Job chapter 38, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the world and said, Who is this that darkened counsel by words without knowledge? God says, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. He asked Job, Where was thou when I, God, 
lay the foundation of the earth? Who hath laid the measuring thereof? Is there, is thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Job, tell me, who did all of this? Who stretched out the heavens? Who formed the clouds? Who strike the lightning? Job, answer me. As we trust God in these difficult times, beloved, we need to know the God in whom we trust. That he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who can do the impossible. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8 it says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Beloved, we may be cast down by tough times, but God will not allow us to be destroyed. So the Bible reminds us that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. We can trust him in our tough times. We can hold on to him because he will not let us go. We can cry out to him in every season, beloved, because he has the answer to all our problems. Today, if you are going through tough times, and you want to cast your burdens upon the Lord, I'm going to invite you to stand at this time. He's able to bear us. He's able to take care of all our uh, problems, all our issues, all our difficulties. The Bible tells us that we should remember our creator in the days of our youth. Remember the creator when things are not so bad. The Bible says, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say I have no pleasure in them. We are living in relative peace and safety, beloved. But let us not take it for granted. But let us use this opportunity to prepare ourselves for the tough times ahead. Things are not getting any better. Things are not getting any easier. The road is not getting smoother. Beloved, the challenges are great. We are living in perilous times. And there are men and women whose heart are failing them for fear. But God wants to do something for you today. And if you are here and you want God to do something special for you, I want to invite you to come down to the front down to the front and allow God to be God in your good time, to be God in your tough time, allow God to be God in all seasons. Christian men and women in these tough times. The Lord is calling us to be true to our call. The Lord is calling us, beloved, to prepare.
prepare ourselves for the hard times ahead. mainly females who are coming up, but I'm going to invite all the men who are in the building to come forward. We're going to have a special prayer for you at this moment. So all the men, please come forward. Press all the way to the front. As we look to Jesus, all the men, please come forward. strengthen you through tough times. He's able to comfort you during your tough times. Even if you're going through difficulty with your health, God is able to deliver you. Because for some of us, that's our tough time. If you're having a problem at home, that may be your tough time. And God is able to bring back the love. He's able to bring back that peace in the home. If your children are giving you a hard time, come. God is able to change them. your presence moving in the hearts of every man, woman, boy, and girl in this place. As your man servant gave the message that you gave him to give, the hearts of your children were moved. And just as you would have it to be in obedience, they've stood, they've raised their hands, they've left their seats if they were able. They've pressed physically and spiritually to the foot of the cross. And so, Father, as you see your waiting congregation bowed in your presence, awaiting a special touch from you, Father, we just in advance want to thank you for what you are doing even in this moment because you alone have the power to set the captives free because you alone have the power of true restoration, because you alone have creative power, because only you can transform us in what we ought to be. It is because of who you are that we, your children, have come to talk to you for just a few more moments. Father, we want to thank you for the men of this church, the men that are standing, the men who are standing in their hearts, we want to thank you, Father, for what you have allowed them to experience. Every single step of their journey leads them to this point of consecration and recommitment even now. Nothing is wasted. Everything had to happen the way that it did in order for these men of God to sincerely and contritely cry out that all they've ever needed was you. And because they are emptying themselves of self and filling themselves with your Holy Spirit, when they leave this prayer, they are leaving restored. When they leave this prayer, they are leaving recommitted. When they leave these prayer, this prayer, they go back to their families better men. 
When they leave this prayer, they go back to their workplaces, better influences. When they leave this place, they go into our communities, better lights. We are grateful for the changes that you are making even now. Father, they already sought you. They already are earnest in their desire for you. Every single day, the men in this congregation are aware of their need of you. It is not easy to be a man in this society today. It is not easy to be a man of color in this society that we live in today. But because these men have you, greater is he that is in them than he that is in the world. The men that we stand next to as women of God today are men who are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The men who we stand and support today are men who are called out of darkness into this marvelous light. The men who we stand and support today are men who are of a royal priesthood, peculiar people, holy nation. They are not like others. They are men who understand what it is to submit to their heavenly father so that they can lead our church and community are right. For the women who are also standing in the need of prayer, whether they're standing physically or in their spiritual stance, we know, Father, that you have not left us or forsaken us either. Father, we know that just as you did in the Garden of Eden, you made man and woman in your image. And so we stand today as women of God, praying for that restoration and recommitment as well. Father, we have all a work to do because in you there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female. Father, in you we are all equal at the foot of the cross. And so together as a church triumphant, men and women, boys and girls, we leave this congregation and this altar of prayer, but we leave fully committed to being sanctuaries where you can dwell with us. So Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for being with us in this moment to give us the strength that we would need to face every trial, every test, to be victorious, and to continue to represent you aright. For the families standing and representing here, Father, we would ask that you continue to pour out into our lives the spirit of unity, because as we, the church, as a family of God, are, so goes society. And so we thank you, Father, for the faith that you have poured out in our hearts today. Father, even now, there are people who are seeking baptism, who have seen the baptism today, who have see, listened to the message, and their hearts have been moved, and they have asked to be baptized. Father, we may not have known the journey that brought them to this point, but you do. And so we submit these two candidates for baptism now into your hands. We ask you, Father, to do in their lives what only you can do. And may every person in this room be a witness that when you call and your people answer, great things are in store. Bless us and keep us, for we pray this with forgiveness of our sins in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the church says, Amen. Jesus as we return to our seats, let's sing that together. Burdens are lifted. Burdens are lifted. for a second in your minds and your support. We have two additional persons who have requested to be baptized today. Amen? So they have been um, in discussion with our elders and personal ministries leader regarding their request for baptism today because although the request came as a surprise to us, 
it did not come as a surprise to our Heavenly Father. Amen. And so um, the decision has been made to proceed to baptism with this mother and daughter. Amen. So what we're going to ask, even though the hour is late, we're going to ask if you would please, if you're able, stay to support the mom and the daughter as they enter the pool for baptism. We're just going to have uh, just a few minutes for Pastor Wilkes to get back in his baptismal attire and the elder that will be assisting him and the deaconesses to prep. It won't take too long, but we're asking if you're able, if you would stay by so that as we receive them into our fellowship subs sub subsequent to baptism, that they would already feel your support. Amen? So we're going to ask if our praise team is able, and they are able, pardon me, uh, if our praise team could please lead us into, uh, oh, they're ready. Praise the Lord. Amen. So. Let us say amen, church. At this time, we have a mother and daughter that request to get baptized today after hearing the message and witnessing those that went before them. We have first Willamede Oswald, and we have her daughter, Geraldine Oswald. I'm going to read to you some vows, and after each vow, I'm going to ask that you face the congregation and state the affirmative yes or I do after each uh, question. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with him? Do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and do you pledge by God's grace to live your life in harmony with these teachings? Do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your, of your belief in Jesus Christ, to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward by your personal influence, tithes, and offering, and a life of service. Elder Small, you heard the responses of the candidates. I make a motion to accept this, these two candidates into the lovely Linden Church, subject to their baptism. It's been seconded and then moved. Any objections? Again, be quiet. Pastor. It's been been moved. The Lord is blessing us such that it's pushed down, but it's still overflowing. At the end of our first baptism, I said, oh, we're going to have baptism next week. And Sister Oswald and her daughter were in the personal ministries room. And she said, I have been convicted. I can't leave church today without being baptized. And this gentleman you see here also desires to be baptized. We're gonna... So I'm gonna ask that you tarry just a little while longer with us. As, as the deaconesses escort Sister Oswald and her daughter to the back, I'll tell you just a little bit about her. We just met. And so, she said, okay, tell me, please do tell me. She said, I was born and raised Seventh-day Adventist. I've been baptized, but I've left the church. I moved from Florida to New York and decided, I promised my father, her father is a, 
She didn't know the English equivalent, but a first elder of sorts, almost a bishop with responsibility at a few churches. And she, he asked her, please, just go to church once. And she's been going, and she's purposed in her heart that she wants to dedicate her, rededicate her life to the Lord. And she wants her daughter to do the same. Amen. Amen. I will also say while she prepares, I said, well, I accept you love the Lord. We can see it. She's getting emotional. But when she said, and I will, there is, there is I won't say it, but I'll say it. There, there's always debates about instantly baptizing. But when she said, can I study the Bible afterwards? There was no doubt in my mind that this was a soul on fire for the Lord. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to ask the church family to stand in support. And we're going to ask... sister, Willamead Oswald, because of your declaration that you want to live your life in a saving relationship with God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, our Creator, the Son, our Holy Redeemer, our Sacred Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our When a mother decides to give her heart to the Lord, it astronomically increases the chances, the odds of everyone in that household giving themselves to the Lord. And so, following her mother's example, little Geraldine Oswald, because of your declaration that you want to live your life for God, I now baptize you. Son and the Holy Ghost. We 
have another person that wanted to be baptized, that wants to be baptized today. He's, uh, his name is Bernard Coleman. And I just administered the vows in the back that was witnessed by Deacon Wilson. So now I will call for a vote uh, to accept this person into uh, Linden Church, subject to baptism. Um, Elder Small, his, his answer was affirmative to yes to all questions. So at this time, I call for a motion that we accept Bernard Coleman into the Linden Church, subject to baptism. Is there a motion? It's been moved. Second? Again, those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Thank you. Those who want to support to come forward as well as stand. How fitting that a father dedicates his life to our father on Father's Day. Tears are joined with their tears. Tears of happiness that you will go down an old man, but come a newborn in Christ Jesus. So, Brother Bernard, because of your declaration to live your life as a child of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, God be the glory. Great things he hath done. See, beloved, it is not men who change the hearts of men. It is the Spirit of God that is working to impact and change lives so that we can be born again into the image of our Father. That was God's intention to recreate his son in us. And as we see in the commitment from these precious souls to give their heart to Jesus, my prayer for all of us is that if there's anyone in the room today who have not yet settled this decision, that you will do it before it's eternally too late. Because God has done everything for your salvation. And he's coming back. He's coming back for prepared people. I was reading just this week that even the angels wanted to give up their own lives and glory for the salvation of men. Even angels. But the transgression was too great. Their lives couldn't suffice. That's why Jesus came and he gave up his life so that through his death, we might have life and have it more abundantly. 
Beloved, let us continue on this path. This is the year of abundance. We're going to reduce the kingdom of the devil and build up the kingdom of God. So let everyone get on board to teach one, to share something about Jesus with somebody. If God has done something for you, tell it to somebody else. It is by your testimony. It is by your changed life. That is going to bring the greatest impact on someone. And especially those who know you before and after. Did you get that? Those who know you before you accepted Christ. And those who know you after you've accepted Christ. They would have seen the change. Glory to God. I want to say special thanks to Dr. Usher for her leadership in our school. Amen. Put your hands together for our principal. She's very supportive of the initiative to study in every class with her students so that we can bring them to Jesus Christ. That is the best education that anyone could have. So let us pray for our schools, pray for our students, pray for our parents who send their children to have Christian education. So may God bless us as we close out today's, today's service with uh, the benediction. Who's up for the benediction? Come, Brother Dawson. Can you invite everyone to stand at this time? Shall we pray? Loving Father, we deem it a privilege that we could come once more again before your presence. We thank you for worship. We thank you, Lord, for the spoken word. We pray, the Lord, that these words are able to find lodgment in our hearts, Father. Be with the, your man's servant, Lord. Continue, Lord, to use him, Lord, so that he could be able to preach your word, so sinners to come to know Christ and accept you before it's too late. Most of all, Lord, we want to thank you for this eight precious soul who you have given them victory over the devil, that they could come into your marvelous light to accept you and go all the way in the watery grave for baptism, to make a public demonstration of their loyalty and their love for you, that they want to go all the way with you. Lord, we pray the Lord may strengthen them. As Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I could do all things through Christ who strengthen them. Help them to recognize that they cannot fight this battle on their own, but they need the power of the Holy Spirit to help them to be overcomers and to live this eternal life. Oh, continue, Lord, to help us as a church that we be as a support system to, to these converts so they will continue, Lord, to walk in your pathway. Continue, Lord, to bless and keep us faithful and true. Be with the men in a special way. We want to thank you, Lord, for the men. Oh, Lord, continue, Lord, to strengthen them, continue to help them to realize their God-given responsibility to be priests and leaders in their home and in this community, in the church, Lord, that they would be men that others could look up to and to call them blessed. Be with the, the women as well, the wives, and other godly women, that they continue, Lord, to support them and encourage them into this walk of life. Bless and keep us faithful and true, and may it take us to, to a various place where both safe, and help them to recognize that the Sabbath day is not over. Bring us back here safe once more again, that we will close this Sabbath in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.